And I feel especially as first gen, right? We mm. are the damn first generation here. We have no other generations in front of us to ask right. for help. Other people or other families have had generations in the United States to try to understand this. And we're like, no, it's just me, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's where it's like, okay, nobody's going to help us but us. Nobody's going to care about your money as much as you do. And we as the comunidad are the only ones that are going to be able to help ourselves. So yeah. if I got the knowledge, heck yeah, I'm going to go out and share it because I'm trying to get all my comunidad going forward, right? Not just me and our future generations, but also pulling our previous generations. So our padres probably with ITINs push them forward and be like, you too can participate in the USA financial system and gain more benefit out of it and gain more money out of it than just the paycheck from your nine to five. You're listening to Yo Quiero Dinero, a personal finance podcast for the modern Latina. I'm your host, Janice Torres Rodriguez, personal finance expert, speaker, writer, and business coach. I teach women of color how to build wealth and gain financial independence through side hustles and investing. On this show, we're serving up POC-friendly personal finance knowledge, always with a side of sass. We're talking about how to make dinero, how to keep it, and how to make it grow. If you're ready to become poderosa with your dinero, you've come to the right place. Before we hop into today's conversation, I want to remind you to follow us on social. If you're loving this podcast and you want more community, you want to find out more about our events and all the stuff that we have going on behind the scenes, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, and everywhere else you love to hang out on the internet. If you're loving this podcast, please take a moment to leave us a review if you listen to us on Apple. It's the easiest way to share our podcast with people that you know and love, and it helps us get discovered by amazing listeners like you. So take a moment, leave us a review, share us with your friends and family, subscribe so that you never miss an episode, and make sure to check out our blog, YoQuieroDineroPodcast.com, where you can sign up for our email list and you'll never miss an episode. Plus, you get exclusive invitations to our live events, special discounts for our digital courses, and as always, our best personal finance tips and advice to help you be poderosa with your dinero. Thanks for listening. Now, let's get into the episode. Maribel, welcome to the podcast. I am so excited to have you here. Janice, thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh, super <laughs> excited. Like I've seen your Instagram page and I was like, oh my gosh, I one day hope to be there. And then you, your team reached out and I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> that means you're doing something that is worth talking about. And I noticed right away, like the fact that you're talking about investing for immigrants is like, yes, we need so much more of this content. So I love what you do. And I'd love to start off with you introducing yourself to the audience for folks who are encountering you for the first time. Let us know a little bit about who you are and what inspired you to start doing this work. Yes. Yeah, so my name is Maribel. I am a an daughter of indigenous immigrants from Michoacan, Mexico. And my parents came over, you know, bajo la mesa, crossing the desert. And so that's definitely a different experience from someone who goes through the normal means. Yes, the coming here, after a while, my dad was deported and me and my mom kind of ended up alone. And she rushed, not rushed, but she went through all her savings. And we ended up living in a car. And so that to me sparks the whole like trauma, like I never want to end up back there. And if I can help any other families, I want to make sure that they don't end up there or in, in any similar situation, right? I want to help them build their emergency funds and help them build those foundations for how to integrate into the finances in the finance community here in the United States. Even if they knew all the laws from another country through and through, coming to a whole new country, all of that goes out the window and you got to relearn everything. And our parents are so into trying to just get a roof over our heads and food on the table. Learning how the financial system works and how to work your 401k, even like top of mind, right? Even for some of us that are first gen and we're born here, we have a corporate job. I would say that some of us don't even know what to do with our 401k right now. We're like, 401k? Like, what, what is that? <laughs> right. No, it's so true. So tell me a, a little bit more about your childhood and, and some of the money stories that you learned growing up and kind of how you started to unpack those stories as you went into corporate America, because I can imagine it's a completely different experience. Oh my gosh, yes. Especially being the eldest daughter in a family, in an Hispanic family, like you are the first one doing everything, right? And then there's also that whole machismo of like, tu eres mujer. And so you've got like these things going against you, as in you don't have anybody in your family that you can ask for mentorship and be like, 
calladita la mano, right? You're you're having to go out and seek mentors and people who you're not exactly sure share the same views or story from you. And that's why I like being here as part of the community because with me, it's like you don't have to bajadita la mano ask me the question. We could just be straight up like, hey, my parents are undocumented. They have an ITIN. And it's like, great, we're not going to get hung up on that. Tell me your actual question, right? I was talking with somebody the other day and they were like, well, was talking about money a taboo in your house? And I was like, I told them the story I just told you. And I was like, it wasn't necessarily taboo because there was no money to talk about. Like I could clearly see that we were going through some shit, right? (laughs) Like there's no hiding it when you have your child in the car and you're praying to God that your child doesn't ask you for food because you have nothing to feed them. So that's a very different story from then people who know like, hey, but there's help. Yeah, you that why didn't she ask for help? Because immigrants don't necessarily know what's open to them in the United States or what's available to them, like food banks and stuff like that. You're afraid that if you go and you're like, hey, I'm on the street with my child, that child services might come and take your child away. There's all these things that go through your head before you're willing to reach out for help. And so for me, That's why I'm, again, here on my platform, because I'm like, I want people to feel like they have a safe space that they can come to and ask those questions where being undocumented or being from an immigrant family isn't the thing that we're going to get hung up on. We're going to get going, move beyond that and be like, okay, let's get your personal finances going. It doesn't matter whether you're a first gen with a social security number, whether you're an immigrant with an ITIN or you fall somewhere in between like a DACA recipient with a social security number, all of the things that we're going to talk about apply. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me a little bit about your career, right? Because I can imagine when you grow up in such a uncertain environment, it can feel like, why the hell am I making plans? Like, why am I planning a career? Why am I going to plan to go to college? Because I don't even know if I'm going to still be here. (laughs) Oh, I knew I was going to be here. I knew I was not going to go back to Mexico because my dad, he got deported. He went back to Mexico. Y cuando lo visito, I see him like once or twice for about 20 minutes every year. You know, so this last time that I saw him, he's like, mija, ¿cuándo te vas a regresar ya a México? Stop living the fast work life in Estados Unidos. ¿Cuándo te vas a regresar a México? And like, settle down, ya es hora de sentar cabeza. And mm-hmm. that means settle down, get married, have your kids, chill. And I'm like, that's not me though, right? Me, I'm more about like, let's build something and help people live a better life. And with personal finance, I found that because... This is the thing that I'm like, oh my gosh, it sparks me so much joy when I see somebody's like light up that I'm like, oh my gosh, yes. And they're like, wait, I can make more money by just having my money sit there and not add any more money. That's like an oversimplification, but it's like, yes, oh my gosh, we're getting it. So I always thought being here in the United States, I didn't know how things worked out in Mexico, right? I just know here in the United States, I'm going to go to high school and then I'm going to go to college. And then I had no plan after that. So honestly, since I graduated college, I've been flying by the seat of my pants and life has more or less like led me down a good path. It's obviously better if you already know what you want. You get there much faster. (laughs) But me, I'm just like, okay. What did you study? I studied international business. Okay. Because I wanted, quería viajar. I wanted to travel, (laughs) see the world. And so, you know, if you know anything about international business, just because you study it doesn't mean you're going to do it. (laughs) But for me, it worked out. I got to study abroad twice because university paid for it. Mm -hmm. And then how did you start off your career? So, what was your first corporate job? So my first corporate job was after I had backtracks through Europe for six months. And I know not everybody can relate, but la cosa era, it was, I had to go for one class or else I would get an F in that class. And so they paid for the flight over and I was like, fuck it. I had been so concentrated on trying to graduate con mis honores, setting up the Society of Women in Business student organization and like doing all these things and like tying all out all of these things that I had started when I started college that I I didn't have any job prospects. I hadn't applied for a single job. And I was like, tengo el tiempo. I have nothing tying me back except my family back in the United States. And I have a little bit of leftover financial aid money. Fuck it. So I stayed there. That turned into like five to six months of backpacking through Europe. And I had a friend too. So I wasn't like completely alone. So I came back. I came back because I packed for summer and it was winter. And I was running out of money. And I was like, okay, my mom has an income tax business. And she's like, you need to come back for income tax season. That's in January. And I'm like, I've run out of money. I'm gonna have to go back. And so I came back, I waited until income tax season ended. And then I started looking for a job. And I ended up getting a job with MGM Studios, 
for $40,000. And at the time, like I thought 40,000, that was the last figure that I had heard from a teacher, like probably five years before going like, Hey, if you get a job and you get 40,000, that's good. Never did I like think to like account for inflation or any of that. And I was like, or the fact that it's kid. LA where it's so damn expensive, right? <laughs> <laughs> so they were like, yeah, how much are you looking for? And I'm like, 40000 And then they came back and they're like, hey, we're ready to make you an offer for, for 40000 I was like, well, what's your budget? And they were like, uh. And then when they came back, they were like, yeah, that's the max for our budget is 40000 So that's how I started my job in finance and entertainment mm -hmm. or entertainment finance. And I was like, I don't even know what I'm doing here a fudge it. <laughs> I'm in LA and I'm in the entertainment industry. So it's like so cliche, but fuck it. This is a job is a job. <laughs> That's amazing. So tell me what that looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. So now I've moved on from there. And after about a year and a half as a financial analyst, I then moved on to become a senior financial analyst. Now for NBC Universal, they have their own zip code. And starting Monday, I'm going to be a manager of finance. So day to, my day-to-day -day is going to change, but basically the latest job that I've had is I manage a multi-million dollar business unit for every, to figure out how much money all those latest movies that you see in theaters are going to make in every single territory except the United States and Canada. Wow. So from living in your car to managing multi-million dollar businesses in one of the most iconic you know, places in the world, LA, the place where dreams are, are born. So when you think about how far you've come, what are some of the emotions that come up for you? At first, especially starting a new position, it's like that imposter syndrome, for sure. Mm. I feel like, and I've heard it from other creators and other people in any industry, right? They're like, even if I've gotten this far from where I started, I still feel that imposter syndrome. There are people who have published whole books and have published a series of books and they still feel that. So I'm like, okay, getting to be like, okay, that's something that's not just me. We're okay. There's also a sense of disbelief. Like, as you just said, like we started living in our car and now I'm here managing this multi-million dollar business. Like, what the fuck? How did that happen? Mm -hmm. What happened in between? And the other part is, okay, now I need to pull my comunidad mm -hmm. with me. So when I was in college, I was part of like student associations, like the Hispanic Student Business Association, the Latinos, Society of Women in Business. And so whenever they asked me to go back and speak, I'm like, fudge, yeah, like full circle. I used to be a student who was sitting there and watching these professionals present. And now they're asking me to come back and do the networking events, do the speaker panels. Yes, I'm going to be there because this is what helped me just feel like there was representation in any industry that look like me. So yes, I am going to go back and be like, try to share that experience and try to share what I've done so that other people and these new students going out into the world also have some idea of what to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's so important to really, and I think that's one of the hallmarks of our community as Latinos. Like we're not selfish. We are very much like, if I get to a place where I feel like I'm the only one here. It's now my duty to bring other people with me. And so I want to take a step back before we dive more into how you began to start teaching, you know, investing and tying your background with finance and all that stuff. You mentioned your mom had a business. Okay. So how does una mujer who's undocumented, who ends up with her child essentially homeless, end up creating a business that I imagine has transformed your family's lives at this point? Yes. So at this point, she does have her residency. But being undocumented and having a business is actually something that one can do in the United States, right? Never underestimate how capitalistic the United States is, which mm. is also why <laughs> I can also teach people who have ITINs how to invest in the United States stock market. So don't let the fact that she has a residency take away from anything here. But she basically worked as a seamstress before and after my dad and se juntó con alguien más. And then there was a comment, you know, she saw something like H&R Block used to, or I don't know if it still does, they, they train you to be an income tax repair. And then during income tax season, in exchange, you just have to work for them. So, you know, her partner was like, my mom was like, oh, look at that. And her partner was like, you should do it. And I was like, uh, nah, you know, and um, at that point, they were having more children. And so whether it was said as encouragement or not, the comment kind of came out like, you're always going to be a seamstress for the rest of your life. Like mm. you don't aspire to anything better. 
And so that kind of hit her and she was like, fuck it. The next day she signed up and she's like, we're now going to be doing this. <laughs> wow. So from there, she worked for H&R Block. After that, she worked for another company. And after that, she decided to, through a series of events, she ended up setting up her own company and was like, okay, I have five children to support. And now she has like a house and a car. And she's like, I have to support for all of this. And my mom is still the breadwinner in the home, right? She's supporting everything. And she has an income tax business and she loves it because even as a seamstress, she was like, it was a seasonal job. And I'm like, that's not seasonal. How's that seasonal? <laughs> and she's like, yes, when it was time to go to Mexico, I would just let them know, hey, I'm going to Mexico. And if they said, no, you can't, there's a bunch of work. She's like, well, I'll see you when I get back. And <laughs> there was one story where she left and they were like, we need to get this out by tomorrow. And she's like, well, I'm going to Mexico. I have an emergency. And she came back like two months later and she's like, hey, I'm back. Um, you know, can I have my old job back? And they're like, yeah, that work that was here, like when you left, it's still here. Like, can you help us finish it? Like, yes, you have your job because she was like the fastest seamstress in the whole fabrica. So she was like, I knew I was top of my game. I could have gotten a job if they didn't give it back to me there. I could have got gone to another fabrica and given it to me over there. And this is minimum wage, no air conditioning in the fucking middle of summer, you have to ask for permission to go to the bathroom. You have to ask for permission to take a phone call back in the day type of job. So, wow. but she was like, I still knew I had it. Like, you know, anyone who I went to go ask, they were going to say like, yes, because they knew that I could get their workout fast. Wow. I love your mom's energy. She sounds like such a badass. And now I can see <laughs> how you came out to be the way that you are, because I feel like that energy is uh, definitely genetic, right? <laughs> yes. And as in income tax repair, she like, she's like, that's what she likes about it is that she has, she works for about four months, duro, duro, todos los días, todos los días. And then the rest of the year, she could go to Mexico, she could go do whatever it is that she wants, but she has basically a seasonal job and it just happens to be white collar. But that also speaks to her being able to budget, right? Because you work for four months and then you're like, okay, there's probably not going to be a lot more dinero coming in unless I like hustle and do other things. And she sells nopales and sells flor de calabaza and all that, but you know, no like steady income. And she does it. She's able to handle all her bills, all her stuff with like four months of income because she's a really good budgeter. Mm. That immigrant hustle is real, y'all. Mm. I am so here for it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Shout out to you and mom. That is amazing. OK, so you have your background in finance. How do you get to the point where now you start coaching people on their personal finances? Or do you become like the person that people start asking questions to or tell me the origin story? Okay, so I went down a personal finance YouTube rabbit hole because I needed to figure out what the heck a 401k was. <laughs> I had thought about going back to school full time for finishing off my master's. When I got into my job, I wasn't sure how long I was going to be there. So I didn't contribute any money to my 401k thinking I was going to need it for tuition. Fast forward, I've now been there for over three years and, you know, I'm getting my manager role now. So like I'm getting a promotion now. So I'm like, we got to fucking figure this out. Like, come on. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're going to leave. Like, let's at least figure out what this 401k is. So I went down a rabbit hole. It was like two to three days long and all my days were meshing into one into the other. I didn't know what day I was living in. I came out on the other side with so much information. I was like, I at least know what a beginner in personal finance needs to know. And so I like the next day I rearranged all my money like I was a good saver, but I didn't have any metas. Like, what was I supposed to do with this money? What was I like actually saving it for? I knew I wanted a casita, but I didn't really know how to get there. So I rearranged all my money and I was like, this is going to go to emergency fund. This is going to be invested. This is going to go to a high yield savings account. This is going to go para la renta. This is blah, blah, blah. Re do all of that stuff that you do as like you're trying to set up your foundation. And then I was like, just like me, there must be so many people that are lost. And I was like, nah, because you know what? Like I'm white collar, but I'm immigrant. That That's probably why I'm lost. But as I, I believe I might've shared like something with someone at work and they were like, oh, wow. And I was like, hold up, you're white collar. You're much older than me. And you're like, you don't know this information? And I was like, okay, people have, to, people have to be lost. At first I gave it a little bit of time because I was like, what if it's just that shiny object syndrome, right? I don't want to start something and then dejarlo. But after a little bit and I was like, fuck it, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And so I did it. I was like, I set up my Instagram and I was like, okay, I'm going to start helping people. And that's how I was like, I'm going to be a coach, right? Just because I was telling someone, I was like, but I'm not that far ahead. Like, no me la sé de todas a todas. And they're like, that's okay. Sometimes people just need someone that's one step ahead of them 
to help them out. And you know, beginner finances, and especially for the immigrant community, because there is like nothing out there. Oh, that was the thing. Right before I set up my Instagram profile, I went and I looked on Instagram and searched for like immigrant or Spanish type content. Y no encontré mucho. If I did find some Spanish type content, it was for other countries. Or yeah, like it didn't relate to the immigrant experience in the United States. And I couldn't really find a lot. And I found a lot of Latino creators, but I didn't really find a lot of Latino creators doing information in Spanish or Spanish and English. And I was like, okay, my platform is going to be Spanish and English. English for our first Jenny. Después hay que le manden el, el, the Spanish content to their parents. And that's how I'm just going to try to help my comunidad, my immigrant community, because I can see how immigrant parents risk casi casi la vida just to get here. Or at least that's my experience and the people that I know. Just to stop one step short of supercharging their money because they don't know what the heck a 401k match is. No, fudge that. We're going <laughs> to get educated and we're going to start making our money work for us. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And it really starts with you just feeling this sense of duty and showing up, right? Like you don't have to have the whole business plan figured out. You just know that this is in your heart and you want to share it. So for anybody who's thinking about, you know, putting yourself out there and sharing something that you have learned, like just do it because we need so many people in our community that are serving as mentors, right? Like we don't have mentors the same way that other communities do. And so we have to start taking on that role for ourselves so that we can all elevate as a larger community. And I feel especially as first gen, right? We mm. are the damn first generation here. We have no other generations in front of us to ask for help. Other people or other families have had generations in the United States to try to understand this. And we're like, no, it's just me, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's where it's like, okay, nobody's going to help us but us. Nobody's going to care about your money as much as you do. And we as the comunidad are the only ones that are going to be able to help ourselves. So yeah. if I got the knowledge, heck yeah, I'm going to go out and share it because I'm trying to get all my comunidad going forward, right? Not just me and our future generations, but also pulling our previous generations. So our padres probably with ITINs push them forward and be like, you too can participate in the USA financial system and gain more benefit out of it and gain more money out of it than just the paycheck from your nine to five. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So let's start breaking down some of the biggest blocks that you have found in the immigrant community around investing and building wealth. What are some of the common themes that you hear from people as to why they don't want to do it. No tienen dinero. Mm. No hay dinero. And um, I I get that sentiment. La misma vez, I think that's where education comes into play, where I use a company, and it's one of the top, one of those big companies, right? And um, oh, no saben that they can even invest. There is so much stuff that people with ITINs in the United States can't do that they're like, if I can't like, quote unquote, earn my money from a W-2 and like, the full sense of the legal law, then I probably can't do a lot of other things with my money. And it's like, that's not true. People with ITANs can get a bank account, get a brokerage account to start investing. They can build credit. They can get a loan for a business, a car, a casa with your ITIN. There is so much stuff that you can do. Do not underestimate how capitalistic the United States is. But going back to the point of no tengo dinero, one of the companies that I use does accept ITINs and you can invest as little as 10 cents. Like one time I got interest from something sitting in a core account and I invested those 10 cents just to show a client, hey, this is how you invest. But to start off with a transfer, you need at least $10, a minimum transfer of 10 bucks. But then because you can buy fractional shares, there is no like, hey, minimo tienes que invertir like 6000 or $3,000 para empezar and no which is why I like really recommending this one company to like the people that I work with. I'm like, it may, there are others, pero con esta, I can 100% vouch for the customer service. I can walk you through the layout porque I've done it. And, you know, and they have translators and they accept ITIN so no te van a poner trabas because you have an ITIN or because you have your DACA with a social security number or just first gen with social security number. You, you know that you can help your family también. If you start an account here, because now you know how to navigate the website, you can then help your other family who's also eligible. Yeah, that's really great to know. And just for anybody who doesn't actually know what an ITIN is, can you tell us what that is and how do you obtain one? 
Yeah, so an ITIN stands for, in Espanol, so you say ITIN. Eating. <laughs> so it stands for an individual tax identification number. This is a number that is given to people who don't qualify for a social security number. One of those situations can be your the person is undocumented, so they don't qualify for a social security number. So they get an ITIN just for tax purposes. This is a number that is given out by the IRS so that people who don't have a social security number basically can file their taxes. So when there's that rhetoric of, oh, immigrants don't pay taxes, like that is so false because otherwise this whole concept built by the IRS would not exist at all. Yeah, that's a really great point, right? There's a lot of that those toxic anti-immigrant narratives that are just not based in any type of fact, like whether or not you are here in this country and you have legal status you still gonna pay taxes. So mm -hmm. where's the lie? You know, <laughs> like this is all a fucking, it's all just rhetoric to really demonize the community that is doing some of the hardest work and some of the lowest paid work and some of the most important work that literally puts food on people's tables, you know? Yeah. And it's just like, it's really unfortunate that there's so much misinformation around the immigrant experience in this country. Yeah. And especially through my research and just knowing as well, some of the, so like people with ITINs, you know how we all get social security taken out of our paychecks? People with ITINs are never going to be able to claim that unless they go through the process that allows them to get a social security number down the line. And then they inform the social security administration that, hey, this ITIN used to belong to me and now I have a social security number, which at one step along that line, a lot of people are just like, fudge it. I'm just not doing that whole process. So a lot of immigrants are putting money into a social welfare system in which they are never going to be able to benefit from. Mm. But also through my research, I found that the contributions of immigrants into that system is what's kept the social security system from defaulting. Wow. Go figure. So they're paying into systems that they cannot actually benefit from but somehow they're stealing everybody's jobs and not paying any taxes. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what a bunch of shit. Okay. Now let's get the other money that <laughs> doesn't get taken out of our pages. Let's make that money work for us just as hard as we do. Mm, yes. Okay. So I think another thing that I have found, there's a lot of mistrust of financial institutions. And I think that can play a really big role in the fear of the stock market and the fear of investing your money. What is your take on that? My take is certain generations are going to be inspired based on what they see. It's more like, I'll believe it when I see it. And that's where my English content is for the mostly the, like the first gen, right? I'm lost. You're lost. Let's figure out our way together. And they'll, they'll take that. And for my experience, so I told my mom about investing and stuff. And, you know, there's the whole, you do you then, <laughs> but still the whole like, Quien sabe, right? Whatever. And so like about a year later, um, we were going through finances and she's like, you have how much in this account? And I'm like, yeah. And I don't know if she didn't see the line below that, which was a different account, which was like, yeah, you should add these numbers together. But she was so surprised at how much money was in there. And she's like, well, how much, like, how much have you made? And I was like, well, right now I'm up $11,000. And this is just investing in like an index fund, right? Because I do not like taking the time. Like I don't have the time <laughs> to do individual stocks. And so that's where I'm like, I kind of took the path down the middle. And in my research, I was like, okay. And taking that path down the middle is you're never going to make more than the stock market, pero tampoco le vas a perder al stock market. And right now I'm still up thousands of dollars that I didn't have to work for. And that to me is like, what? First of all, when I growing up, I always thought, You need more money. You need to get a second job. You need to put more hours in. And so investing has allowed me to see that, no, not necessarily. No, you don't. And I already know that I wasn't going to spend this money for a while. I was like, quiero la casa. But again, it was still like, am I going back to school full time? It was just taking years. Even though I wanted it, I didn't have like a date of like, okay, this is when I'm going to do it. So I was like, fuck it. We're just going to invest that money. And so right now I'm still up. Like, I think it's still like 11,000, 10,000 at least money that I didn't have to work for. And now it's long-term gains. And now I can take it out with less taxes than I would have paid had I earned it in W-2 and less taxes than I would have paid if I had left it in there for less than a year. And that's some stuff that, that brings in my tax background that some people are like, oh, shoot, I didn't even know that. I didn't even know that if you leave your money in an account for less than a year, you have to pay more taxes than if I just leave it for one year plus. 
Yeah, there's so much information. And I think a lot of people get overwhelmed once they start finding out like how much they don't know. So Mm -hmm. what's your advice for people who are feeling that overwhelm that is stopping them from even starting this process of becoming an investor? I would say for me, for me, what worked was just start, right? There's never going to be a right time to start. Just fuck it, do it. You can go try to become educated either through books, YouTube, mentor, if like anything else, get a coach. Like that's where I feel like a coach comes into play because at least for me, the way I coach, I want to take your personal situation into account. And, you know, what is your income level? What are the options available to you? Do you have a 401k match? Yes. No, not everybody does. Do you have ESPP, which is Employee Stock Purchasing Program, because your company is traded in the public stock market? Yes or no. So everybody's situation is different. And I think that's where they get overwhelmed. And that's why I decided to become a coach and why I want to build this course that is kind of taking our perspective into account, the immigrant community perspective, pero también going like, hey, here's a section about this, here's a section about this. But if it doesn't apply to you, feel free to skip that. Because when I went down my rabbit hole, I went through all different tangents and a lot of the stuff didn't even apply to me. But that was just trial and error, right? It's like you're going through one street, dead end, go back, go through another street, dead end, go back. And then you're just trying to figure your way out. We just got to get educated, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. You got to start somewhere, y'all, because doing nothing will just lead to more nothing. (laughs) Exactamente. Okay. So I think another thing that especially people who are undocumented might be concerned about is like, if I get deported, Mm. what the hell's the point of having this money invested? Am I even going to be able to access it if I get kicked out of the country? Yeah. And that's something that I'm thinking about adding to the course because I have had that question come up. And you can. So just like como puedes meter dinero al banco y lo puedes retirar, same with your investments. So if you're about to get deported, you know, you should have a plan. What is just like, what's my emergency plan? Like, just like we're supposed to have earthquake plans and hurricane plans. We should have a what if I get deported plan. And that includes, you know, leaving some passwords behind. Also setting up beneficiaries, like who else also setting up powers of attorney? Can your kids handle your accounts? You know, if they're gone, do you have someone here that you trust to handle those? Or worst comes to worst, you're like, I have nobody or I don't trust whoever's I'm leaving behind to be able to take care of this money. Like they're too young o algo así. Then have that plan to be able to retirar ese dinero. At the end of the day, like a lot of places or some places are going to want you to go in person. And so you need to know what those places are. Is it that the bank? Is that the brokerage company? Put those top of lists to take your money out from there, if that's what you're going to go with. And then the other ones that are like, hey, puedes, how do you say, not depositar, pero transfer the money to another account. Have an account in your native country. You never know when you're going to need it. So maybe you could just transfer that money over, just like you transfer money here in the United States from bank to bank, igual. So there are things that we can do, right? There are steps that we can follow. Pero para hacer eso, nos tenemos que sentar and really think about where our finances are right now and what we want to do with that in case we get deported. It's one of those things that we don't want to think about. Pero cuando llega el momento, it's better to have a plan than to be caught like a deer in the headlights. Yeah, that's such an important thing to think about. And, you know, I will say as somebody who is Puerto Rican, where, you know, anybody who's born either on the mainland or on the island, you're automatically an American citizen. So just the fact that that's not something I've ever had to personally experience just speaks to how diverse our experience within the community of Latinidad can be. And I think it requires, you know, I've also seen something that kind of disturbs me in that there's almost like some level of superiority for people from different communities as to like, well, I did this the right way and I got here the right way and I paid all the fees and I did all the things. What's your advice on how we can be more gracious and compassionate towards each other, knowing that there's so many different experiences of what it is to be Latino, especially in in America? I think just be open to hear other people's stories. Although there is that, oh, I did it right, and my family's trying to do it right, and because other people are doing it wrong, my family can't come in. I've heard that narrative as well. 
And for us, especially as first gen, like we can't, we can't change that. Right. We didn't. Nobody asked us uh, if we wanted to be here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It was just like, this is where you're born and we're born into the situation. Right. I think just being open to other people's stories, not like acknowledge the hardships that other people have to go through in getting here as well. And just like being human is going to bring out that compassionate side in us of like, well, fuck, like your parents had to go through a desert and got caught multiple times and like still decided to risk their lives. And we know a veces get tan brutal the people that are guarding the border are and they're not even necessarily hired by the government. (laughs) So and but they're allowed to exist. And just thinking about that, right? Like one time I was like, and not to menospreciar the experience, I was like, mom, I, I kind of want to take that journey just to know what it's like. And my mom's like, no, como crees, van a quitar los papeles, van a pensar que tú eres pollera. And I'm like, I mean, yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. But also I want to just, I'm the type of person that would rather go through experiences. And I feel like putting oneself in that situation where you can go through that experience kind of brings that a new level and sense of understandment you see no if you're like i'm not doing that also just talk to those people and like especially as first gen or at least me i was born here right but how many of us have sat down with our parents or our grandparents to ask them about their journeys and to really understand what the heck they went through i bet you if you sit down with them you're gonna be like oh fuck like I probably yeah. wouldn't have done that because honestly, if I was my mom and through the experiences that I've had in my life, I probably would not have taken that chance. I would have been like, well, no, I'm just, I'm going to stay here. <laughs> yeah. Having that perspective is really powerful. And just, I think it's so important for us to understand the true sacrifices that our families have made. Cause I think we can tend to become a little removed from mm-hmm. the experience as time goes on. And just like remembering where you come from is super fucking powerful. Like, you know, the fact that you come from people who were really willing to risk it all. I think te da una confianza in what you're capable of because I'm like, yo, if they were able to do that, like, what the hell is stopping me? You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> and why did they come here? It was most of the families, what they say is to provide a better tomorrow for their families, right? Yeah. So if you're then afraid to do something because, oh, I, I don't think I'm going to do it. I think I'm going to fail. Bro, your whole family literally almost risked their lives so you could have this chance to do it. Go and at least give yourself the benefit of the doubt and try it. And if you fail, at least you knew you did it and you don't have that thing stuck in your head going like, what if? Mm, Yes, that is a whole word. I think that might be the quote for the episode. (laughs) (laughs) Go ahead. (laughs) Okay, so let's talk about what are some of the initial, like what's the, the steps, right? To begin this process to investing. What would be kind of your recommendation on where to start so that it's maybe the easiest way? So my end goal is always to get people investing, but that's not necessarily where I start them off. I start them off going with one question. Do you know what your net worth is? And a lot of people look at me blank going like, I have no clue. And your net worth is basically all of your assets with all of your debts put together. And so you can either go and start doing a budget. But there's an easier way. There's a free platform that I use. And I don't know how you are about mentioning brands. No, yeah. Shout them out. Shout them out. Okay. So I use Personal Capital, which basically... I love them. Right? I love... I like... They have pictures in pretty colors. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And so basically, they're managed by a wealth management group. And so once you get to 100K net worth, they'll like try to offer you their services. But you can always say no. And the tool is still free. So I like it because you can link all your accounts, all your credit cards, but your bank accounts, all of that stuff, put the value of your house, and it tells you what your net worth is. Like instead of us trying to spend hours trudging through your bank statements, like let's spend like 30 minutes and just link all these things and you're done. We can move on to the next step. So I think knowing your net worth is the first thing and being able to track it because we want to then know we're probably going to have to make a little couple of changes right where your money is allocated and mejor a la mejor menos in going out and a little bit more just going to investments and a little bit going to your savings if you don't have an emergency fund because that's the next step build your emergency fund este but we also want to be able to track it because we want to see are these changes actually helping you or 
are you like saving from going out, but then you ended up spending more on traveling that you hadn't even planned, but you had the money in your bank account and you were like, "Ah, I can go. Right. And that shows us personal capital has these graphs that shows you your net worth throughout time. So I really like it because it's an easy way to audit a client's finances and for them to also audit them without having to get bogged down in the numbers. Because I'm like, I understand the numbers, but I also understand that pretty pictures help out understand some information as well. Yeah. No, that's really good. I love their their tool is so easy to use. And if you have any concerns around like, you know, linking your bank accounts, I promise you like they're world-class encryption and it's just like, you need that information if you're going to really see that holistic view of your finances. You know, if your net worth is negative, mm-hmm. then that means that you have more debt than you have assets. <clears throat> if it's positive, then you have more assets than you have debt. So it's just like, it's a starting point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So after we know our net worth, after we've built our emergency fund, is that when we should start investing? Todavía no. Well, we go into a couple of things. First of all, what are the tools that are already available to you in which you can start investing? And some people are like, none, because I obviously don't invest. And that's where we go into, do you have a 401k? And people are like, oh, yeah, I, I start le meto dinero. It's like, how much? I don't know, 60 bucks. Are you getting a full match? I don't even know. <laughs> and that's where we're like, I send them back into, okay, let's do some homework. Go ask your HR or ask them to give you the number of the brokerage company, whoever can answer them. Do you get a match? How much money do you need to put in to get the full match? And if you have great customer service, like the company that we use, they'll walk through the scenarios with you and do the numbers for you. And they're like, hey, you get a 6% match. That's X amount of dollars. That's how much you need to put in. And then they're like, okay. And then after that, we go also go through tax advantage and not tax advantage. So the Roth versus traditional type of thing to help you pay taxes, either less taxes, either at the end of the year or at the end when you're trying to retire. And this is where like that tax background comes in. And I like mix it with the financial and go like, okay, let's mold all of this and try to get you to pay less money legally. Pero también gain more money out of that money by investing it. And after that, also explaining how does an individual retirement accounts or an IRA, how does that work? And so it's like, great, now we've got you with those tax advantage type of accounts. What about your FSA and your HSA, which a lot of people don't think about? And this is like a flexible spending account or a health savings account. And basically, this is pre-tax money that you can put pre-tax money into, but you can only use it for health expenses. And the HSA... A lot of people in the fire community use it because you can also invest that money. And so let's say you have a surgery now, you can go like 20 years later, 30 years later and be like, hey, can you reimburse me for this? As long as you have that receipt, now that your money has already had time to grow in the stock market in the meantime, throughout all those years. So these are things that I know I didn't think about when I was starting off. I was I thought investing was just investing in a brokerage account in the stock market right away. And it's as through my research, I found that there are so many things that you can activate in order to start investing that money, but also saving on taxes. And that's what we want to do, especially in the United States and especially here in California. I'm like, how can I save taxes but doing it legally? Absolutely. So I know it's probably safe to say that a lot of immigrants, especially those who are still trying to get through the process of obtaining the residency, might not have access to jobs with benefits and things like 401ks and, you know, HSA accounts. So what options do they have so that they can also participate in the stock market? Yeah, so you can get an IRA, individual retirement account, they are eligible for that. And so taking one step back, if you are a person who did end up getting a job with benefits, and you know, at the end of the year, you do your taxes with an ITIN though, know that you are eligible to claim those 401k contributions plus your employer match plus any growth that has come from that account. Even if the way the account was set up was based on a social security number. So I went through like a deep hole, ended up on like this message board of just people who handle brokerage accounts. <laughs> Somehow I was like, I don't even know how I ended up here, but I was looking for the specific um, piece of information. And yeah, they're like, we're not the company. The company is the one who decides whether you should be hired or not. We only take care of the brokerage account. And we, our main concern is that the money goes to the person who earned it and contributed it. So all you would need to do in that case is after you leave that job, you need to call the brokerage company and say, 
this is me, you know, identify yourself and say, I actually have an ITIN number and you want to change that. Apparently, the way they take it would be in the similar sense of it was a data error. They're like, just like somebody could mess up their social security number and put a six in front of a two instead of the two in front of the six, same thing. And I'm like, well, but that's different, right? Social security numbers start with a six and ITIN start with a nine. But they were like, we basically just care from the messages that I was reading. It was like, they just basically care that the money goes to the person who earned it and contributed it. And they're like, it's not under my purview to say who should get their money back and who shouldn't based on their immigrant status. And those are like the nuggets, the golden nuggets of information that I hope and seek to bring to my comunidad. But for the people who are like, okay, I work with a job, don't have benefits, you can still get an IRA, individual retirement account, because you can open that by yourself. You can still get that brokerage account. And let me see, you can still build an emergency fund. You can still build sinking funds. So there are a lot of concepts about personal finance that still apply and can still help set you up. You can still build credit that can later down the line get you a loan, again, as we said, for a casa, a carro, with a lower interest rate. So all of these things are what are still available for people with ITINs. And you can also thereby pass that information to your children and start building generational wealth that way, right? Because generational wealth isn't necessarily only dinero. It is also information on how our generations can start building their financial future here in the United States. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so I think if you're first gen, you might relate with this sentiment where you feel like it's not only up to you to build individual wealth, but you also have to build generational wealth to help past generations who could not. And so I think that tends to overwhelm people. It makes them feel like they is so much pressure that it's like, oh my God, how am I supposed to do this? What's your advice for us? Because it's a hard thing to, I think, accept. And then it's a hard thing to navigate and feel like, like you don't start building resentment because the people that came before you couldn't do this. You know, it's almost just like, why me? Why do I have to do all this? Why is it got to be so damn hard? Yeah, um, that's where my situation is slightly different. My mom is trying to build something for herself back in the motherland. Her plan is just to go back and live back in Mexico. And from what I've heard from other parents, at least the people that I associate with, their plans are very similar. They are like, yes, I have my children and my grandchildren here, but I ultimately want to go back with my parents and, you know, see them live out their lives and live out my life in el, in el campo, calmadito, not in the suburbs, eh, you know, rodeado de familia. So my first question would be like, do you know what your parents' retirement plan is? Even if they say it's you, okay, wait, right, but what does that look like? Am I supporting you in Mexico? Am I supporting you in the United States? Am I supporting you in a whole different country where the conversion rate from USD to whatever the currency is, is much better? Because that will help alleviate some problems, right? At least here from the 90s to now, one USD is 10 to 20 pesos in Mexico. And that can still go a pretty far way. So, hey, if you tell me that I need to support you, but in a different currency, I need to do that math. And that can help me alleviate some of that pressure. Secondly, as the helping them, right? There, Someone once said like, hey, I have so much pressure because I know that I'm the retirement plan. And I'm like, oh, cool. So you so they must be retiring soon, right? Like in a year or two. And she's like, no, they have like decades left in front of them. But I know I'm the retirement plan. And I'm like, okay, if they have decades, ask them if they have a 401k at work and ask them if they get a match. And, you know, you could still set up an IRA for them. Help them start contributing their money to their retirement. A lot of the reason why we're like, I'm my parents' retirement plan is because that's the way it's been done for generations but probably generations in another country. There's that cultural norm where we're in a whole different country. And if we're trying to break those, what some people call, what is it? Generational traumas. Trauma. Yeah, I guess. Or, or cycles. Yes. Generational cycles. It's like the understanding would be that, yes, I will take care of my parents, but that's because my children can take care of me. And at least for me, the idea is like, no, I'm going to try to take care of me so my children can be free to do whatever they can with their own money. But for that, I need to make sure that the cycle stops with me. And so in order for 
me to help myself. I need to probably help my parents in becoming educated there in the United States. I just learned that with an ITIN, they can have a brokerage account and a retirement account. Let's get them going with that. And if they're going like, oh, no, but why am I going to invest my money? Let them know that you're investing your money too. Like you're taking the same risk with your money that you're asking them to take with theirs. Pero también tener todo guardadito. That's why we have the emergency fund, first of all. Este, or be like, what do you want to invest in? Do you want to invest in some land back, you know, where your family lives? Do you want to build something where your family lives? There's multiple types of investments, including real estate and stock market. So you can help them understand what is their retirement plan. And I know some parents are going to be like, I'm years away from that. You know, I don't want to talk about that right now. Pero el tiempo no para. El tiempo va a pasar. And you're still their retirement plan. This Just be like, this is me, your retirement plan, asking you to sit down. And we're going to hash out this retirement plan. <laughs> yes. We have to talk about that stuff, y'all. Like, it's so powerful when you start being the example, right? Like, for me, I started talking to my parents about investing, I want to say maybe like two years ago at this point. And... They were doing, you know, the bare minimum with the 401k at work. And my mom didn't start investing for retirement until her like mid 40s because she didn't even work full time until that point. Mm -hmm. But now they both have Roth IRAs. They have brokerage accounts. They're like, what should I be investing in? And I'm just like, yo, I could not have imagined having these conversations a couple years ago. And asking those questions can help you get them out of maybe bad decisions that they've also made that you have no idea about. Like I started asking about my mom's 403B at work because she works for the school system. And I found out that this man who is a financial advisor in air quotes signed her up for like a variable annuity that like locked up her money and did some bullshit. And I'm like, yo, if I had known what I know now, like 10 years ago, I could have saved her from having this money locked up in this bullshit ass investment. So after talking to her and realizing like what was going on, I was like, we're going to call up this man. We're canceling this shit and we're going to tell him, no, thank you. She's going to put money in a Roth from now on and control her investments hundred percent. But it's like, if you don't even know the right questions to be asking, you mm -hmm. can't facilitate that conversation and really get your whole family in a place where they're making really good decisions that are going to serve them in the long term. Yeah, and I feel like that's where coaching comes in, right? We help you understand what are those questions that you need to go back to those people that handle that money and ask in order so that we can get further with your money. And that way we can start helping not just ourselves, pero también our familia. Because once you gain that knowledge, there's nothing keeping you from using that same information with your family members, incluyendo tu mamá, tu papá, tu hermano, tu hermana, el tío, la tía. If you know, sometimes you have to help them help themselves. And that's where you with that knowledge can come in and be like, and now I know how. Absolutely. Like my niece now has a custodial brokerage account. Hey. My, my sister is out here with her Roth IRA. She's like, I'm putting money for my daughter because I'm not going to be repeating the cycle. I'm like, yo, if that's the whole purpose of you being the first, it's totally worth it because you're changing mm -hmm. the generational cycles with your knowledge like it's powerful yeah and then understanding how all of those accounts affect or don't affect fafsa right for me i'm like i paid for my college tuition with fafsa and academic based scholarships and so i was gonna open like a brokerage account for my sisters but doing the research i was like brokerage account is not the good account to be putting their money in i need to do it in a different type of account because otherwise it could affect their fafsa and i do not have that much money to put two children through college like back to back and like two more <laughs> after that in a couple years right, right. when tuition goes up I was like no and we need to figure out what these accounts are how they work and what benefits us the most and they also benefit you in taxes if you put some money into these type of accounts for children to be going into college some of them depending on how the stuff is written can help you as a contributor lower your income tax how much income taxes you owe at the end of the year basically mm -hmm. Yeah. I love this conversation, Maribel, and I love what you're doing. So tell us more about where we can find you and what you're cooking up for people to learn about investing. Yes. So I am most active on Instagram under the handle at Our Wealth Matters. And um, also on Facebook, I have a Facebook page, a TikTok, and there is something else that I'm currently forgetting. 
So I have currently I'm offering one in one one hour coaching sessions, but I'm working on putting together a personal finance course that is tailored specifically to the immigrant community. So everything that I'm going to be discussing applies to like us as first gen with a social security number all the way down to our parents with an ITIN and anybody in between like a DACA recipient with a social security number. And we're just going to be going as we discussed here, we're going to be starting at the basics, like what is your net worth? And building you up all the way to, okay, let's get you investing. Yeah, that is such powerful work that you're doing. And I'm so glad that you're speaking to a portion of our community that really has been neglected for so long by the personal finance industry. I think these topics are so important and voices like yours matter so much. So thank you for giving us permission to, you know, think about building wealth as first gen and just really being able to be that spark that changes things for our familias for generations to come. And thank you so much, Denise, for having me. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you are ready to take your dinero to the next level, Sign up for our free 14-page guide, The Financially Lit Latina, the ultimate blueprint for becoming poderosa with your dinero. This 14-page guide includes our best tips on money mindset, budgeting, debt repayment, career, investing, financial independence, side hustles, and more. And you can get it completely free. So to get your copy of The Financially Lit Latina, just head over to yoquierodineropodcast.com slash start. That's yoquierodineropodcast.com slash start and start transforming your dinero story today. Until next time, stay empowered, stay inspired, and stay poderosa. On the Yo Quiero Dinero podcast and associated entities, all information provided is for general information purposes only and does not constitute accounting, legal, tax, or other professional advice. Listeners should not act upon the content or information found here without first seeking appropriate advice from an accountant, financial planner, lawyer, or other professional. We assume no responsibility for information contained on this podcast and associated entities and disclaim all liability with respect to such information, including but not limited to any liability for errors, inaccuracies, omissions or misleading or defamatory statements. Usage of this podcast and associated contents constitutes an explicit understanding and acceptance of the terms of this disclaimer.